Canadian Anti-Semitism Education Foundation, uh, fondly known as CAFE, the Toronto Zionist Council, and Canadians for Israel's Legal Rights. I'm Andrea Spindle, Executive Director of CAFE, and I'm pleased to see so many of you here this evening. We're most grateful to Chabad Flamingo and Rabbi Mendel Kaplan for agreeing to host our program in their beautiful shul. And special thanks to several very special friends whose support has made the program possible tonight. Joe and Renana the Minor, Irving Weisdorf, and Goldie Steiner. And thanks to all of you for coming, and for those of you who have already made a financial contribution to SEA, to Newsrail, thank you. I want to encourage people tonight to think about making a contribution, if you haven't already, to support this new initiative that you'll hear about, that, for which our guest speaker is very involved, um, and that is newsreel.com. Before any formal introduction of our speaker, I'm going to give you a short commercial about CAFE. Our organization is 20 years old. It's a registered charitable organization that has been at the forefront of educating Canadians about anti-Semitism. In all that time, many suggested we were fear-mongering, exaggerating, playing politics, when in fact our founder, Shirley Ann Haber, who I'm delighted to say is here with us tonight, was doing more than just reading tea leaves. She recognized that anti-Semitism was invading our institutions, that Jew hatred was always just under the surface, that Israel was being scapegoated for many evils in the world, and she saw that Jews were being comfortable and did not want to rock the boat. Anti-Semitism on the far right was easily identified, but in the interim 20 years, it's the ex exponential growth of anti-Semitism on the far left and from Islamist scholars and organizations that should now concern us. CAFE does not have all the answers, but we have two major ideas. Firstly, Jews must stand proud and loud as a people and as Zionists. And secondly, we must work together across denominations and political persuasions and with our allies to rid Canada and the globe of the scourge of Jew hatred. Let's at least reduce this horrible impact on our educational systems in universities and in the media. So Keith invites you all to become involved. And I hope after tonight, many of you will think about joining us and working on projects. We're joining another organization. We're very collaborative and we work with many and we'd be happy to share information with you. Tonight we have the opportunity to hear from a man with unique expertise. Dr. Mordechai Kajar has a breadth of knowledge of the Arab world, Israel and the Middle East relations that is unmatched. Dr. Kajar is fluent in Hebrew, English and Arabic and is often interviewed on Arab television and regularly solicited for explanations on Arabic thinking and approaches to issues and on what is being said on the Arab street about Jews, Judaism, and Israel. He has significant knowledge of Arab mass media, popular culture, and gender issues in Islam. Mordechai is a former but now retired assistant professor who taught at Bar Ilan University, Tel Aviv University, and Ariel College, as well as being a member of three research groups in Israel. He is a research associate at the Begun Sadat Center for Strategic Studies. He was a branch head in military intelligence, retiring from the IDF as a lieutenant colonel after many years of active duty. He is a founding member of Habib Anisti, Israel's Defense and Security Forum, which is keeping the diaspora informed daily of events in the current war and providing valuable advice to the Israeli government and the military on strategic and ta tactical issues, drawing from its 22,000 person membership of active and retired IDF officers and operatives. Dr. Kadar is a founding member and vice president of Newsreel, which has an app which we should all now download in order to have up-to-the-minute news from Israel. In May 2021, when introducing Dr. Kadar, I said, Dr. Kadar has agreed to address the current situation of conflict within Israel, and that coming from Gaza, and to put this jihad into perspective for us. Well, here we are three years later, and we have a very similar topic, almost an update. We have requested that Dr. Kadar specifically talk about the situation in Israel from the perspective 
of rising anti-Semitism within Arab-Israeli society and in Judea and Samaria among the Palestinian Arabs. No one would question the notion that Hamas has built a culture of Jew hatred, but that's often not mentioned in the Western media, which focuses on civilian losses, demanding ceasefires, and ignoring the damage done to Israel. Many in diaspora communities may be unaware of how Jew hatred is playing out in major ways within Israel and the territories, and how that impacts what is going on here in our own society. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Mordechai Kedar, after which questions will be handled in a Q&A moderated by Dr. Sean Egan, a professor in the Department of Molecular Biology of the University of Toronto, and a CAFE board member. So hold your questions until after the presentation. And I'm just going to make another little commercial announcement. We will also invite you to give a donation. And if you support what Dr. Kadar is saying and doing, we invite you to make a donation through CAFE to Israel. Dr. Kadar. Thank you so much, Andrea. This introduction, in my humble view, is too long and too, de too detailed, and it, in, I'm afraid that the expectations of people are too high for me to meet. <laughs> uh, however, uh, the sponsors which were mentioned, I don't see Goldie Steiner here. Oh, she's uh, not here tonight. Okay, so uh, we thank her. In absentia. Um, first of all, I would like to share with you the, the information about Newsline. Group of Israelis, including myself, decided three years ago to do something rather than complaining uh, about the Aspar, about the, uh, the public, public relations of Israel. And, uh, you know, many people complain about the media, people maybe complain about the government, complain about this, everything. So we can continue complaining. We decided, instead of complaining, to do something. And as you might know, uh, today, youngsters, you, in general, they do not watch TV anymore. They don't sit at home watching TV. Maybe some games, but they, in general, the knowledge which youngsters, they're talking about people are, up to, up to 30 years old. Uh, they don't watch TV uh, like most politicians. They don't have the time, they don't have the sablano, the they don't, you know, the patience to see them. And well, all they do all day is sit standing with, with their phones and they die. Die all the day. Scroll. If, if, if it's Facebook or all kinds of of uh, applications, and we decided to go to that direction, to create an application named Newsreel, N-E-W-S-R-A-E-L. Uh, and you can actually download it right now. Please do it. Newsreel in your app store, both on Android and iPhone. Newsreel, install it and use it. It is for free with advertisements. If you want to get rid of the advertisements, it will cost you 20 cents per day. Please, I think it's seven Canadian dollars per month, five American dollars per month. So you get it without uh, uh, advertisements, because after all, we operate it with the advertisements and the income which we have from Google, which already covers the uh, current uh, expenses not being developed. Um, we uh, give information for 250 contributors, and the number of uh, items which you have every day is around 100. There is no other source in English which gives you such a quantity and quality, of course, of information, analysis, uh, in text, in pictures, and in video. And you can share it, you can do, you can do whatever you like with this, you can uh, uh, send it to others, uh, and this is a very good source of knowledge. 
Now, this is something which, yes, it, it's not biased, but we don't bring all kinds of information which uh, try to show Israel as a pariah state, like the New York Times or things like this. We don't bring these things. Uh, we bring uh, accurate information, and everybody can, can draw the conclusion by him or by himself. And this is our policy. Uh, we call it Zionotech, uh, technology which, which supports Zionism. And uh, uh, we didn't market it. This is the thing. People just, just download it because they hear it from relatives and friends or from occasions like this. And so far, we have thousands of daily users without marketing. Without marketing, before marketing. If we market it, it will be much more. We look for investors for marketing. It, uh, whoever wants to participate in this, or any income we go to marketing the, the product. And I highly recommend to download it and to use it. You'll enjoy it uh, very much. This is about uh, news line. And this evening is actually was arranged by the CEO of uh, Newsnight with the people here, with Andrea and the, the colleagues. Hi, hi, Robin. I appreciate your support for many years to Israel, Zionism, and to the activities which are supposed to promote Zionism and Israel. Um, and whoever doesn't know, CLR, Canadians for Israel's Legal Rights, is actually the, the NGO which uh, Goldie runs. Thank you so much, Goldie, for everything that you do for the state of Israel. <laughs> the topic of tonight is about anti Semitism uh, in Israel, means within the Arabs in Israel. Palestinians as well. First of all, uh, in many cases, Arabs and Muslims uh, refuse to have any connection with the word anti-Semitism because they keep claiming that they are Semites. So how could they be anti-Semites? Okay. So if I take this uh, reservation from using this term, <laughs> I use Jew hatred or um, anti-Jewish sentiments or, or kind of this Jewish uh, uh, particularly in order to emphasize the fact that this hatred is not directed against Muslims or against Arabs, it's against Jews particularly. So instead of anti-Semitism, Jew hatred, I think, fits better. So after all, factually, this is what we mean by anti-Semitism, so we can be more specific. This is the first thing. So second thing, um, many Muslims claim that they cannot possibly be anti-Semite or anti-Jewish because Islam cherishes the Jewish prophets, and Islam actually came to the world to verify Judaism and Christianity and emphasize what is being written in the sources of both Judaism and Christianity. This is what they claim, especially in occasions of interfaith uh, dialogues, which uh, we can find in many places. Many people uh, try to bridge between the religions in order to calm down the hatred and the terrorism. The problem is that uh, those Muslims who take part in these interfaith dialogues are viewed as traitors by the radicals. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter for the radicals that there are Muslims who take part in interfaith dialogue. They are not impressed by this, and this does not weaken their zeal to hate Jews and to harm Jews and to act in a terroristic way against Jews. So, uh, to, just to begin, interface dialogue has influence only on those who take part in this dialogue. Very rarely you could see that the influence 
of interfaith dialogue exceeds the border of those who really, who actually take part in this dialogue. So it, it is a good uh, source of uh, good food or, or miles in, in the, you know, uh, to, to accumulate miles of flights when you fly to all kinds of places in order to meet with uh, other with people from other religions. But uh, the, the impact which it has on uh, other people, especially the radicals, is minimal, if at all. This only just to touch this point. Uh, however, when we come to Jewelry in, in Israel, within Israel, and don't forget, we have 20% of Israel uh, citizens are Arabs, most of them are Muslims, some of them are Christians, Jews. We have also Alawis in Israel, we have Ahmadis, we have others. And, but most of them, like 86% of them are Muslims. And uh, of course, the, what they call Palestinians, uh, in, those who live in Judea and Samaria, in Gaza, uh, 96, 97% of them are uh, Muslims, uh, 34% of them are uh, Christians, and this is uh, what we have. So definitely we are, uh, we live side by side with many Muslims, those inside Israel and in Palestine. <laughs> And that attitude means, first of all, let's start with the Arabs within Israel, those who are citizens of the state. There are many Muslim citizens in Israel who serve in the army. One of my students, uh, his children are all serving in the army. He is himself is blind, so he couldn't serve, but all his children are healthy and they serve in the in the security force, whether in the army or Mishmar Gvul or in the Mishmar in the police. Uh, so they are wholeheartedly with Israel. He is from a Bedouin origin. He lives in the north. And uh, many of his uh, village, uh, Wadi Salama, are uh, serving in the Israeli uh, military. Uh, and, they are, and they are wholeheartedly with the, with the, with the state. And uh, one of his family was killed recently. Another one was kidnapped by the by Hezbollah in 2000 from the Hermon, the Sawai guy. So definitely there are, and there are many of those. So there are Muslims in Israel who are all partly with Israel, although the state presents itself as a Jewish state or state which belongs to the Jewish people. And the, the flag is with Magen David only, without crescent and without uh, a cross. And uh, the national anthem is called Old Balever, Penima, Nefesh, Yehudi, Omiya, as long as in the soul we have a Jewish soul which uh, longs to return to Zion. Uh, so, and they know exactly everything which is, the, especially the, the Jewish genes by which the country was established, with everything, they accept the country, the, the, the state, the way it is, and they serve wholeheartedly, and for them, there is no, they don't have any other state, and they will defend the state, even in the price of uh, their life. Not only this, in the atrocities of, of October 7, of Shemini Atzeri, in Israel, there were, first of all, uh, like 30 Bedouins were kidnapped by by Hamas. And a group of Bedouins from Rahat, Rahat is a Bedouin town in the south to the west from Be'er Sheva, they, with their van, went back and forth, back and forth to the Nova uh, party area in order to rescue youngsters, boys, girls, they loaded on their, I think they had a Chevrolet Ram, one of those, they loaded like 30 of them every time, you know, as many as possible in order to save them and to, you know, to bring them as, as, as fast as possible out from the scene. And they came in risking their own life, you know, to go uh, to the place which is uh, infested with the Hamas uh, 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 fighters. This uh, was a real risk and they deserve every word of praise uh, which uh, we can find. So definitely there are 
Arabs, Muslims in Israel, who are definitely good citizens, good people, and uh, they are with us in everything. However, inside Israel, and of course within the Palestinian Authority as well, we see the other, the other problem. We see people who keep inciting against the state, especially the Islamic movement in Israel, which is a Muslim Brotherhood organization, especially the, the, what we call the northern wing of this organization, headed by Sheikh Raid Salah uh, and his deputy Kamal Khatib, who is well known all over the, the Islamic world because of YouTube and his sermons, which are all uploaded on YouTube. And believe me, I still don't know how come these people are out of jail. Because in Israel, you are not supposed to, to uh, incite. And there is a law against it. Yet, for some unknown reason, the prosecution never heard about this, never saw it. Once in a while, they go to, the, to, to, to prison for a For why? If they do something like spit at uh, a policemen, this is something which the prosecution will take to jail. But not for what they say. Why? What they say is way much more dangerous than what they uh, speak. Okay? So, uh, the, the Islamic movement, especially the northern uh, wing, is uh, more or less uh, Hamas when it comes to what they say. What they say is actually what Hamas said. They don't do because they, are, they will be sent to jail. But they say how, the, in the articles of Sheikh Haid Sarah, the, the leader of this organization, are published in the website of Hamas. So this shows you the resemblance or the proximity of his ideas and Hamas ideas. They don't publish my, my, my articles, although they were, many of them are in Arabic, they, 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 they publish his, his uh, articles. Okay, so this is. Uh, so we have. The whole array or the whole spectrum between those who are wholeheartedly with us and with the state and the others on the other side uh, are totally against us. And everybody in this Arab sector are at some point between these two poles on the spectrum between those who are with us and those who are totally against us. So uh, everybody places himself on the scale. Uh, whether it's with the country, more or less, and this is, and this is dynamic, because in, in times like today, you can see radicalism grows, because it can work. They did it. They succeeded, especially in October 7, which inflated the jihad glands in the bodies of many of them, who were maybe, would do it until then anything, since they saw what they saw, especially on the social media, uh, they got encouraged and now they support Hamas. More or less what happened in many other places in the world, which what happened in October 7, definitely encouraged them to increase the actions against Jews, against Israelis, what we saw on the, uh, in the campuses here as well. Within the Palestinians, uh, we see Hamas, a, an organization which is based on the on the teachings of the Muslim Brotherhood, and uh, they, because they could, they became a, a whole army in Gaza and in Judea and Samaria as well. Uh, although Judea and Samaria, Israel is uh, more, uh, you know, watching them and arrests them when needed, catches their weapons, the ammunition, the or the places which they produce uh, weapons. And uh, Israel is much more present in Judea and Samaria rather than, rather than Gaza, for which we, we, we drew in September 2005, and ever since June 2007, when Hamas took over Gaza by force, they were left alone to do in Gaza whatever they want to do, including a whole industry of weapons which are produced according to prescriptions which come to them from, from uh, Iran. And uh, unfortunately, uh, they succeeded to build a, a big uh, army machine uh, against Israel, uh, 
including the help of the Egyptians. Uh, and there are all kinds of pieces of information that President Sisi's son was actually the one in charge of smuggling weapons, ammunition from wherever it came to Egypt into uh, uh, Gaza. And he made gazillions out of this industry of uh, smuggling uh, weapons into Gaza. However, when we try to understand what pushes these people, we have to look at their teachings, we have to look at their ideology, and we have to analyze uh, what they believe and what, what they carry in their heads against us. Because without this, they don't do anything. In order to understand their motivation, both in Israel, the Muslim Brotherhood, and Hamas in, in the Palestinian side, which is more or less the same, we have to understand the Islamic approach to Judaism. And here I'm not talking about radical Islam, I'm talking about Islam. Because this is, this is the core uh, belief of Islam. Islam came to the world to replace Judaism and Christianity. This is, in fact, uh, they actually took or copied the Christian theory of replacement one step forward. Now, Islam came to the world to replace Judaism and Christianity. Means whatever was uh, ever Jewish or Christian, becomes Islamic. Means that Abraham was the first Muslim, Je uh, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, his sons, uh, the Sfatim, were all Muslims. David and Solomon were Muslims, Jesus Christ as well. And King Solomon built a mosque in Jerusalem. If you don't know. Okay? Uh, we could describe it as re-engineering re of history according to the Islamic views. Um, since Islam came to the world, Judaism and Christianity are not involved because Islam came to the world to replace them. So they don't exist anymore. And therefore, uh, since Judaism doesn't exist anymore, why do we need uh, a Jewish state? There is no need. Because Judaism doesn't mean anything anymore. So there is no reason to establish a Jewish state. Since Judaism doesn't exist. So Israel has no right to exist at all, even if it was on a square centimeter on the seashore of Tel Aviv, because Judaism doesn't exist anymore. This is one reason. Second claim, second uh, issue which they believe in, is that the land, the, what, the, the land of Israel belongs to Islam. Why? According to Islam, the Islamic Sharia, any land in the world has only one way ticket to become Islamic, not to get out of Islamic home. And since Spain was once under Islamic rule. The island of Sicily, the southern part of Italy, uh, large parts of the Balkans, all the way north to the gates of Vienna, where they were defeated in September 11, 1683. This is why September 11 was chosen in 2001. Uh, all the space, all the way to Vienna belongs to them. And of course, the land of Israel. Because once they were ruled by Islam. And since there is no way to take any land, any land out of the Islamic home, these countries should return to be Islamic. Spain included. So, uh, who the heck gave the, the Jews the land of, of, of Islam? What, the British? who occupied it in the First World War, John Balfour, in his declaration of 1917, who the heck gave it to 
Balfour to give it to the Jews. But it belongs to Balfour. It belongs to Islam. Legal document <coughs> which CILR shows so eloquently, the organization which uh, Goldie runs, and who the heck gave it to the League of Nations with all those nations like Japan which voted for adopting the Balfour Declaration and elevating it to a level of a legal document in the international arena. Who the heck gave it to the League of Nations to give it to the Jews? Later, if you want to run forward, uh, the United Nations, which decided in 1947, <coughs> November, to uh, the, the partition plan, excuse who gave it to the United Nations to, to divide it between Jews and Muslims? Who, who are they? Who gave it to them? And later, every country which recognizes Israel, what is it? First of all, uh, President Trump recognizes Jerusalem as the capital of, of the land of, of, the, of the state of Israel. Who the heck gave it this country or this, this city to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of the Jews? This is Islamic place. This is how they look at it. So, from the territorial point of view, Israel belongs to them. It's the land of Israel belongs to them. So <laughs> nobody in the world has the right to take it out of the Islamic world and, or, and to give it to the Jews. So from the point of view, Israel has no right to Th The third problem is that the Jews are not a nation, are not a people, a people. They are communities which belong to all the nations in the world. Jews in Canada belong to our Canadians from the national point of view, who happen to be Jewish, like other Canadians who happen to be Christian, Muslim, or whatever they are. Jews in the United States of America are American from the national point of view, who happen to be Jewish like others who are not Jewish. A Jew in Iraq is an Iraqi Arab who happen to be Jewish, just like other Iraqi Arabs who could be Christians, Sabais, Mandays, Zoroastrians, Muslims, or whatever they are. So there are some Jews also in Iraq. The Jew in Yemen, the same, is a Yemenite Arab, welcome to be Jewish, or Jews in Russia, whatever. Jews are not a nation. Jews are communities which belong to all the nations in the world. So since they are not a nation, why do they need a state? Let them all go back to wherever they came from. And this is their approach. Now, in this point, I must say, they look at us from their point of view. Why? Islam is a religion, did not merge all the Islamic, all the Islamic nations into one nation. In Islam, there are Arabs, and Persians, and Turks, and Kurds, and Baluchis, and Azerbaijanis, and Tajikis, and Uzbekis, and many others in, 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 in Africa. And the, the religion, the Islamic religion, did not combine them to be one nation. Arabs are Arabs and Persians are Persians. The same thing with Christianity. Because Christianity, you have Koreans in, in Christian, Christians, you have Norwegians, you have Canadians, you have, you have many nations which are, which are Christian. And the Christianity did not combine them to be one nation. So why Judaism should combine the Yemenite Jew with the Canadian one? Islam doesn't do it. Christianity doesn't, doesn't do it. So why Judaism becomes a, a national issue or ethnic issue? So since they project their situation on us, they don't accept our claim that because we are all Jews, we are brothers with the Yemenite and the Iraqi and the American and the Canadian. They don't accept it. So since there is no Jewish nation, because any religion, any religion doesn't make a nation, so why do they need a state if they are not a nation? So from this point of view, also, Israel has no right to exist. And the fourth element is the Jews and 
since they did not believe in the prophecy of Muhammad, they all have to live under the yoke of Islam as thimis. Now, for this, you have to read a whole book written by Bat Yeor. Bat Yeor is the pen name of a Jewish lady named Giselle Littmann. She lives in Switzerland. She is still alive and kicking, no, alive and writing. And I wish academicians would be as fertile, uh, literally, uh, as she is. Uh, like every year she comes out with a new book uh, about Islam. She presents her, her pen name is Bat Yeor, the daughter of the Nile, uh, because she was born in Alexandria. She lives today in Switzerland, but uh, uh, since she was born in Alexandria of Egypt, she presents herself as Bat Yeor, the daughter of the Nile. Uh, she wrote a whole book about Vimis and Vimitude, or Islam and Vimitude, this is the title of the book, in which she describes all the rules uh, under which Jews and Christians can and should live under the Islamic uh, regime. F just to give you some, exam some examples. Um, a Jew and a Christian are not allowed to ride a horse, only a donkey, in order to humiliate them. A Jew and a Christian have to pay jizya. Jizya is a head tax. Uh, every month, they have to come to the tax collector and to come into the room to crawl on the ground and to give the money from their hand to get a kick and to run out of the room in order to implement the pasuk, the verse in the Quran, means they should give the jizya from their hand while they are humiliated means they have to be humiliated while they are paying the jizya every month. Okay, so this is another thing. Uh, another uh, thing which was invented in Islam is the yellow patch. The yellow patch was not invented in Germany of the 30s or the 40s. This was invented in Baghdad of the 9th century under the Abbasids. Uh, Jews were forced to mark themselves with yellow patch or yellow scarf or yellow hat, while Christians had to mark themselves with a purple uh, patch or scarf or a hat. Why? Because Jews and Christians are impure, and everybody in the school should know that there are Jews or Christians in order not to touch them because they are impure. So the, the markation of Jews came from Baghdad, not from, of course, the, the Germans took the same thing. Uh, Jews and Christians are not allowed to be in any connection with citizens of other countries because they might uh, reveal our secret, in the Islamic State uh, secrets. Uh, Jews and Christians should walk in the middle of the street while Muslims on the side. Why? In the Middle East, those who were walking in Jerusalem saw so the, the, the middle of the street is lower with two or three centimeters from the sides of the street because in the Middle Ages, they didn't have sewage under the buildings or under the street. Whatever came from the households was in the street, in the middle of the street. And not only from the kitchens. Okay, whatever came from the house. And Jews and Christians are, should walk inside this sewage canal in the middle of the street, while Muslims are walking on the uh, sidewalk, which is uh, clean and uh, dry. So uh, this is only the tip of the iceberg of the rules. Of course, the house of a Jew and Christian should be lower than the neighbor, the Muslim neighbor. The synagogue of the church to be lower than the, than the mosque, and uh, many more uh, rules which were designed in order to denigrate and to humiliate the Jew and the Christian because the Jews and the Christians did not accept the prophecy of Muhammad. This is how Jews and Christians should live. They don't have any right to estate, army, police, government, 
or any other manifestation of sovereignty uh, because they should live under the yoke of Islam. Okay? So this is the fourth. The first is the religion, which doesn't exist. The second is the land, which belongs to Islam. The third is the fact that they are not a nation. And the fourth is that anyway they have to live under the yoke of Islam is this. Okay? Because of all these four elements, Israel is a Jewish state, supported by the Christian world, Balfour, etc., has no right to exist, even if it was on a square centimeter on the seashore of Tel Aviv. And this is the, not the radical Islam, this is the teaching of Islam. This is not the uh, They are more than sure that Israel is a deed of a saint because of this. And not only this, it's a collaboration of Christian world and the Jewish world against Islam. After all, Balfour and the Zionist movement started the whole thing. So, uh, 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 and the worst is when Jews uh, are willing to pray on the Temple Mount. Because the state, the, the existence of the state since 1948, which is not allowed according to Islam, <coughs> totally uh, forbidden in Islam. And then in 1967, Israel liberates parts like Judea Samaria and Jerusalem, and Jews want to pray on the Temple Mount. All these forces since 1948 or since the beginning of the Zionist movement is viewed by Muslims as some kind of, I would say, resurrection of Judaism. Yes, this is the world. After Judaism was cancelled by Islam, now Judaism goes through its process of resurrection, coming back to life in the form of a state, in the form of army, police, sovereignty, land, and government in Jerusalem. And the worst, is Jews who pray on the Temple Mount. This is the pinnacle of the problem, the worst problem. And this is why they so uh, uh, vociferously uh, uh, object any activity of Jews on the Temple Mount. We know the war we started on October 7 is called in, in Arabic, Tawafan al-Aqsa, means the typhoon, the Mabul, the the flood of an Aqsa. Although it is in Gaza, but their mind is in the Temple Mount. Why? Because in the Temple Mount, this is the place where Judaism comes back to life. And this is what they cannot accept, cannot fail, cannot, cannot take. It. And this is why this is something which aggravates them the most. Because they know what was done. They know that there is the place which Judaism will come, come back to life. By the way, this is why they closed the Shah al Hamim, the gate of mercy in the eastern wall of the Temple Mount. And not only this, they made a cemetery uh, be, beyond the gate in order to prevent the Mashiach from coming because the Mashiach is supposed to be a Kohen and a Kohen cannot enter the uh, cemetery. Little they know that cemetery of going doesn't uh, work this way. But, but uh, this is the reason why they placed uh, a cemetery out of the Shah al Hamim, the gate of mercy, in order to prevent the Kibula, the redemption to come through what the Jews uh, To that degree they are afraid of the resurrection of Judaism. And this, uh, uh, this issue of uh, closing the Shah al Hamim did not, did not start in uh, 76 and no. This was hundreds of years already, which they are very much aware of the possibility that Judaism will one day come back to life and they will do anything needed in order to prevent it. So the Jew hatred, which is reflected by, by these people, is not something which comes because of the occupation. Because for them, the occupation of 1967 is not the only problem. The occupation of 1948 is the problem. 
And that's why in the vocabulary of Hamas, uh, Kfar Aza and Nahal Oz and Tel Aviv are settlements, no less than Ariel and Yitzhar and Itamar. Settlements. Because everything which Jews are doing on Eretz Israel is settlements, means illegal, illegitimate, <coughs> unacceptable. And this is why they name everything, including Beiri and the Nahal Oz as settlements. And those who live there are settlers, no less than those who live in Itzhar and Itamar on the hills of Samaria. So this is their mindset, this is their view. And this is what pushes them and motivates them to do what they do to us, including raping our girls. So what is the hope? If this is the situation, according to Islam, by the way, it's shared by Egyptians and Moroccans and Tunisians and Persians, Shia as well, although according to the Shi'i verse of Islam, Jerusalem is not holier than any other uh, city, because the third place in holiness after Mecca and Medina, according to the Shia, like Iran and, and, and Hezbollah, is the city of Najaf in Iraq. This is the third place in holiness for the Shia, not Jerusalem. Jerusalem is only sacred, viewed as sacred, the third place in holiness after Mecca and Medina, only for the Sunni, for the Sunnis. Yet, the returning of Judaism back to life and the fear for this is shared by Sunnah and Shia alike. So this is why Iran is so much against Israel, not because Jerusalem is holy for the Iranians, but because the, the resurrection of Judaism is viewed as dangerous for the Shi'i Islam as it is viewed by the Sunni Islam. And that, this what makes this conjunction or the collaboration between Sunnah and Shia against Israel. This is what explains it. They, are, they will fight each other on every other issue. Why? On the issue of the state of Israel, they are united and even more than this. Ladies and gentlemen, where is the hope? The hope lies in Islam. And for this, we have to understand it. The Islamic law, Islamic Sharia, is based on principles like. Judaism is not a void, but it is based also on the precedents which were made by the Prophet Muhammad, and they would say peace upon him. Uh, what do I mean? Muhammad was and is viewed in Islam as a man who, as in Arabic, ma'asum, means somebody cannot make any mistake because he is informed. Allah saves him from any possible mistake. Means everything which he did in his life was actually directed by Allah. Therefore, he couldn't make any mistake. He uh, migrated or oh, ran away from Mecca, his birthplace, to Medina in the year of 622. This is his biography. The Hijra, what we call Hagira. Six years later, when he was already the ruler of Medina, he, in 628, he decided to conquer Mecca and to take revenge from those relatives of his who kept him away and almost murdered him in 622 when he was forced to run away. He prepared an army and went down south from Medina to Mecca in order to conquer Mecca, to burn all their idols and to force them to convert to Islam. However, they had a good intelligence which didn't, which didn't go to sleep in that night. And uh, they uh, prepared a very big army against him. And when they heard that he is heading down south to conquer Mecca, they took their army and they went north in order to stop him in the way. Both armies met each other, means they saw each other and stopped. Uh, near a village named Hudaybiyah, which is between Mecca and Medina. And when Muhammad saw this big army which they prepared against him, the long swords which they prepared, and the young camels uh, who could run very fast, 
He understood that if he messes with his army, this will be his end. His end and his army's end and his, his, his message also. So he sat with them for a couple of days in Hudaybiya, in that village, and they came to terms. Means they signed a temporary peace uh, for nine years, nine months, and nine days. 999. Uh, and the sign shook hands. He returned to Medina, in the north. They went down south to Mecca. And they waited here to see his intentions. They saw that he doesn't do anything against him. They waited another year. And they saw that he lies. He doesn't do anything. So they understood they still have almost seven years in, of peace with him. So they took the camels and they, to, they were merch merchants. And they went to India, they went to, to Asia Minor, and what today Turkey is, passed near Medina, they waved peace, hi to him, he waved back to them. To them and they were, were very confident that the peace will be, uh, will be between him and will be kept. And uh, they went to business. When he understood that they went to business and left the city with a small army, he raided Mecca again and burned all the idols, converted those who succeeded to convert to Islam, killed all the others, took the way, took the ladies, and this was the end of the peace after two years only. This it was the 630. From this precedent, precedent Muslims learn two things. The first thing is, if you, the Muslim, if you are weak and your enemy, the infidel, is strong, and if you mess with him, this is the end of you, you can give him a temporary peace and let him fall asleep on God. Deceive him, give him temporary peace. This is the first thing which they learn. The second thing is, when and if Allah gives you the opportunity and the ability to do to the infidel what you have to do to the infidel, you do it, even within the time of the temporary peace. Why? Muhammad did And if you did it, this is the halakha, this is the Sharia. Because he was directed by Allah, who made him inform. Okay? So, this is the what Islam can give to others who are too powerful. This is the precedent. Is it still valid until this very day? It's from the 7th century. Well, when President Sadat of Egypt uh, wanted, to, wanted to make peace with Israel, in 1979, after his initiative which started in November of 1977, he had a problem because this was totally unacceptable by Islam, as you know. So he issued a question to the Al-Azhar. Al-Azhar is the supreme Islamic authority of Egypt. Uh, whether he can make peace with the Zionists or not. Now, since they get their salary from him, they understood exactly what he means by this question means they are required to issue a fatwa, means psaq al a verdict, which will allow him to give peace with Israel because he needed this peace because of the cotton in Egypt which was, uh, uh, which was destroyed by an insect and he needed a, a loan from the Europeans and the Europeans made a, made a condition. If you don't have peace with Israel, we will not give you the money because we don't want this money to go to hell. So, so he came to Israel in 1977 to offer peace to Israel, and then, and then Azhar allowed him to make peace with Israel according to what our prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah did in Hudaybiyah, which is mentioned specifically in this verse. Means the peace between Israel and Egypt is based on the fact that Israel is too powerful because they failed in 1948, they failed in 1956, they failed in 1967, they failed also in the attrition war in 1969-70, they failed also in, in the Yom Kippur War in 1973, in spite of the surprise. 
So Israel is invincible. Israel is too powerful. So we can give Israel a temporary peace just like what Muhammad, our prophet, gave to the infidels of Mecca in Hudaybiyah. This is what they wrote to him in this world. So Hudaybiyah is still alive in the 20th century. I didn't find Hudaybiyah mentioned in the peace between Israel and Jordan. I didn't look for it also. However, Arafat, who signed with us the Oslo agreements, kept saying time and again to his people that this is a Hudaybiyah peace, means something temporary. We heard it. We heard it in Johannesburg. We heard it, heard it in other cases, in other occasions as well. And people started in Israel to raise questions. What do you mean? Hudaybiyah means a temporary peace. What? Are we going to have a Palestinian state or Palestinian state and make, as it was viewed in those years, uh, uh, only because it gives us a temporary peace? What will, what will happen at the end of the temporary peace? Uh, are you buying a house or temporary purchase? Uh, uh, no, you, uh, peace is something which should be forever. Okay? And um, uh, of course, Israelis gave the answer to themselves oh, this is only for domestic consumption, in order to convince the people to go with it. Because if you would say that this is permanent, they would not go with it. Okay? But again, if it's only temporary, why, why go with it? in order to establish anything if it is only the important piece. But this is what the, the Israel leadership of the 90s, led by Shimon Peres, decided to do. And we are stuck with this, uh, with this agreement until this very day. However, what do I mean? If Israel is a strong, uh, powerful, determined, invincible, it will get temporary peace, as we already get in with Egypt and the Palestinians. If Israel will be powerful, deterring, invincible forever, Israel will get temporary peace forever. <laughs> this is the Middle East. Because by definition, Israel cannot enjoy permanent peace. Because Israel, as I mentioned, has absolutely no right to exist to begin with. Because the Jewish religion is not a void, Jews are not a people, the land belongs to Islam, and Jews anyway have to live under the Islamic yoke. All these four reasons and the resurrection of Judaism. The Israel, to begin with, has no right to exist. Israel can exist with peace, only as long as it is powerful. Ladies and gentlemen, Egypt, which signed us uh, peace in 1979, which is what, 21 and 24, 45 years away. Uh, this peace is more or less. Uh, it didn't prevent them from being part of the armed smug smuggling to Gaza. Uh, but Egypt keeps buying weapons, tanks, there are 4,000 tons, uh, all made in America. Uh, the, in their gears, the enemy is in the east. And the enemy of the east from Egypt is Israel. And uh, there is a guy in Israel named Eli Dekin who keeps shouting and screaming that the Egyptians are actually preparing a war against Israel. Uh, so far, we don't see the war, but we see all kinds of preparations in Sinai. Uh, yet, Israel is still uh, deterring the Egyptians, but nobody should take the Egyptians uh, for granted, because all they have with us is a temporary peace based on the fatwa, which was issued by the Azhar to Saddam. 45 years past, and this is a spark in history. There is a verse in the Quran which says, Inna Allah Allah is with those who have patience. And they can wait. A generation, two generations, three generations. Unlike us, 
means us Westerners who want everything instant. I want it now. Peace now. We want the instant coffee. Everything we want now. We don't. In elections, you know, four years. To us, it look, look, to us, it looks like a long time. But the clock in the Islamic world, hundreds of years. What I don't achieve, my son will achieve. What I, my son, my grandson, what grandson, the grandson. Yes. This is how they think. Because Allah is with those who have patience. And they have patience. They waited. Look, Hamas. Hamas took Gaza over in June 2007. And they accumulate weapons, ammunition, they dug the tunnels, they develop whatever they needed in order to launch the attack in October 7, 2023. 16 and a half years. They wait patiently. Worked in order to enhance their abilities and caught us in a minute which we were not prepared. Definitely a big failure of the intelligence, and I, as somebody who wasn't the intelligence, they really don't. I'm devastated because of the, the failure of the intelligence of the, that day, uh, which reminds me personally of the failure of the Yom Kippur War. Because in Yom Kippur War, I was a soldier. I actually was already three years soldier. And I was recruited in 1970. And I still remember. The atmosphere, I still remember the failure of the intelligence to shout about the forthcoming uh, uh, war. And uh, in spite of all the signs, there were people who were uh, sleepwalking vis-a-vis uh, -vis what we saw 50 years ago. And exactly 50 years and one day passed since October 7th, oh, October 6th of 1973 to October 7th. 2023, exactly 50 years on one day, and Hamas repeated the same thing in a in a, in a policy, uh, against Israel. So uh, this is uh, what happened. They waited very patiently. Not on this day, they deceived us. You know, and there is a hadith means an oral tradition in Islam, which the Prophet Muhammad is quoted to say, "Al Harb Khuda means. The war is deception. Means the war includes also the element of deception. Means it's not only the sword itself, it's also what you do, what you say, how you behave in order to deceive your enemy. And they did it very well. They gave us the impression that all they want is to send workers into Israel. All they want is to have good money, good income, a, a vaccine for the coronavirus, uh, whatever, you know, makes life normal. And, and most of the Israelis, including the intelligence, thought that all they want is to have a state in Gaza. And they will not put the state in danger by attacking Israel. This was the pre-assumption which was shared both by the intelligence and the political issues as well. It's like echo. They echo each other, the political arena on one side and the professionals on the other side said the same thing, echoed each other's uh, uh, ideas. And uh, this is why nobody noticed that there were papers, that there were warnings, that there were articles. For example, one which I wrote already in April 2023, and I, you can read it on JNS in English about the uh, war which Iran prepares against Israel, an all-out war which will include Iraq, the militias which are in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Gaza, in Yemen, all these arenas together, including the internal arena in Israel and the Palestinians, of course, in order to topple Israel within a week. This, is, this was the Iranian uh, plan. I did not expect, or I, didn't, I did not think that Hamas will go by themselves, and they did. Uh, because that article talks about a multi-front uh, war. Today, what we have with Hezbollah, and probably with, with Iran as well, 
if uh, Israel attacks Lebanon and Hezbollah, uh, and we hear also in the Golan, those militias who are in Syria, which are in Syria, in Iraq as well, and the Houthis. So little by little, uh, a, a multi-front uh, uh, war is maybe uh, accumulating around Israel. So uh, more or less what I want in that article, although in that article I thought that they will start the war together with a barrage of missiles and drones against Israel, followed by by uh, incursion on the earth, as we saw in Gaza, also in the north, and so forth. You can read the article uh, on James. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the situation around us. This, this is the atmosphere around us. This, are, this is the content of sermons around us in Israel. Unfortunately, with the speakers of the Israeli wing of Hamas, means the Islamic movement. This is what we hear in, in also in the Temple Mount by the preachers of the Palestinian Authority, including one named Isa Amir, who is uh, facing the Israeli court in, in July. And I was asked to give an opinion about his uh, sayings in, in this court. Uh, yes. We face these people and it's a democratic state which is supposed to allow freedom of speech. Uh, it's not so clear where is the red line between uh, sermons and incitement. And because always the incitement is hinted, the incitement is implicit, it's never explicit or explicit in Hamas, but those who are inside Israel inside the Arab sector and in Jerusalem, they say it implicitly. Because they know that if they, if they say it explicitly, they will, go, they will go directly to jail. Implicitly, it is subject to interpretations. So this is what we are surrounded with. And we have to bear in mind that uh, only if we will be united and strong, because, you know, Together, or united we stand, divided we collapse. And unfortunately, what happened in 2023, the demonstrations against the government, and the suspicions of uh, pilots and the uh, 8200 unit, my unit uh, people who said that they will not come from Iran for reserve, uh, all kinds of fighters, all kinds of uh, units, they actually inflated the jihad glands in the bodies of our neighbors. We, in the ISDF, we shouted and screamed about this. We warned them, guys, if you want to have a political struggle, okay, go to the Knesset and manage the struggle in the Knesset. There are ways how to do this in a democratic state. If you block the roads, if you demonstrate in no restrictions, and the worst is if you announce on the papers that you will not go to the army to serve in in the reserve, this you are actually destroying the Israeli deterrence, which was achieved by blood. You are destroying the army, which belongs to you and us as well. Those who are for for the. Uh, judicial reform and those who are against. We don't have two armies. We have only one. And if you destroy the army, the state cannot survive. And we said it explicitly, especially Amir Avivi, and I'm uh, in, 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 in the board of his organization, and I did, we shouted it and we wrote it time and again, and they didn't listen. I have nothing against uh, uh, protest against uh, judicial reform. If you think the judici judicial reform is, is wrong, Go to the Knesset, go and do whatever you have to do, you know, by political means. And there are, there are political means. But to destroy the army because of judicial uh, uh, reform, this is something which brought the war because they, they saw what happens in Israel and they thought 
that if they kidnap 250 Israelis, Israel will never invade Gaza. And this is what they thought. That the big war will come one day when they are with all the weapons. And why they, meanwhile, uh, uh, kidnap Israelis and as a return succeed to release all the prisoners and they will be much more prepared to the big war which I wrote about. And this is actually what happened. And this war was a surprise for the Iranians, was a surprise for, for, for Hezbollah, because Hamas did, did it by themselves, did not wait for all, everybody to launch the war. Read, the, read, read this up. So what I mean is that, uh, unfortunately, uh, there were Israelis funded by American money. Uh, Ehud Barak is, 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 the, is the leader. And uh, Shikma Bresler, professor in the Technion, I would expect her to understand something. After all, professors, you know, professors know everything and nothing but. And this is what pushed her. And uh, another guy, Moshe Redman, Redman, and many others who followed them, funded, were funded by all kinds of foundations. I believe that Qatari money also is poured into this Islamic uh, spin in Israel because Qatar is the violent enemy of Israel. Eleven years ago, I published an article, Know Thine Enemy, about Qatar. You can find it, just Google, Kedar, Know Thine Enemy, if you believe it, it is better. And the, these people did not understand what is happening around us. Although we said it explicitly time and again, we warned them, you are destroying the army, and this will bring results which you don't which you don't want. So whom they whom, whom do they blame? Baby. Look, exactly. I, I, I'm not I'm not here to say that Bibi is, is here, but Bibi has no other army. The government has no other army. The government has no other Shabbat. The, the, the government has no other Mossad. The, the government has no other uh, uh, intelligence to know what happens if they decide not to do, not to work or not to volunteer. Israel is in a problem. And Israel, yes, is in a problem. And I think that the, the, the whole thing was created by those who did not find the border between a, a legitimate struggle against a judicial reform and a struggle which was meant to destroy the country. And this is actually what they did. And they still don't understand because they are renewing this uh, these days or these weeks. And unfortunately, uh, this is something which we have really to take care of. Ladies and gentlemen, I am a compulsive optimist because uh, first of all, I don't have other choice. Secondly, uh, the Jewish people went through way much worse situations. Just to give you a comparison. Uh, Israel, in the la la last uh, Yom HaTzma'ud, day before, is the Yom HaZikaron uh, for the Hanalei Tzah. I think that the number of Hanalei Tzah since 1840, or, or the dose who fell on the altar of Zionism, uh, is 25,000 and some dozens. I forgot exactly the number. Meanwhile, they came more. This number, 25,000, was the harvest of two days in Auschwitz. It is chilly. But this is what was. Since 1840, since the number the fallen people in Israel was starting to be counted until this very day, and I'm talking about almost 200 years, was the harvest of two days in Auschwitz. So we definitely went through way much harder times compared to what we go through today. So this is why I'm optimistic. <coughs> we are there, we are fighting on the front with Gaza. Now we are preparing apparently a war against Hezbollah. 
Um, Gallant was, or maybe still is, in Washington, maybe to coordinate with the Americans uh, this war on Lebanon, on, on Hezbollah, which owns Lebanon. And uh, I, I am optimistic because we don't have any other choice but to win in this war. Because everybody in Israel, even those who destroyed the Israeli deterrence, know that the, if Israel loses the war the first time, it will be also the last time. Everybody is aware of it. And therefore, I'm optimistic that in the end of the day, they will find a way, instead of to quarrel together, to fight together against our enemies. Thank you so much.